Hello, this is Jack Jackson. Today we're going to talk at the symmetry involved in a circle, and say the unit circle in particular. And we're going to look at what's going to be um, involved in some trig functions here, and how this is going to give rise to some identities. So notice that we have a lot of symmetry in this circle. So if you pick the opposite x, notice that you get the same y. And this happens no matter which quadrant or axis that the angle is on. Anywhere that you are, if you have a x, y here, you get the opposite of x, y here. So here x is positive, but even if x is negative, the opposite of x will be positive, And you'll be over here in this quadrant. So it doesn't matter which quadrant you're in, you're going to get the opposite x, but the same y. If you do the opposite y, but the same uh, then you're going to end up with the same x because of some symmetry here, or you can end up with that. And the point is, is that when you do this, you get the same, you get congruent reference triangles here. Okay, when you have the opposite, same x and opposite y, that does give you another point on the same circle, and you get congruent reference triangles there because of the symmetry. Um, in a similar manner, if you have both the opposite x and opposite y, notice what happens now is your angles are pointing in the opposite direction altogether. These vertical angles here are congruent, so the reference angles are the same. And so again, you get congruent reference triangles. So what happens is these have the same size of x and the same size of y as each other, but one's positive. They're both, well, either they're both positive here in A, and they're both negative in C, or here X is positive, Y is negative in the A, and here X is negative, Y is positive there. But anyway, they're opposite signs. The angles are going to be, or the terminal sides are going to be pointed in opposite directions. But if you look at all of these here, all four of these situations, okay, and where's the other one? There it is. All of these situations here, because of the symmetry involved, you're going to get congruent reference triangles there. Okay. So this is going to lead us to some identities. The first one I'm going to look at are supplementary angle identities. So if we're going to look at an angle of pi a supplementary angle, okay, so look at the one over here. So the, the green angle, the big angle here going to the to the point B from your uh, initial side there. Uh, let's see, maybe I need to change the name of this point. That could be the point one zero on the unit circle, for example. Okay. So these two angles are supplementary. The red angle T is the same as this reference angle over here, and the supplementary angle here goes to point B for the terminal side. So what if you notice about those two supplementary angles, one is T, one is pi minus T, or 180 degrees minus T, and they have the same Y, so they have the same sign, which means they have the same cosecant, same S-I-N-E sign, so sine of pi over t is sine of t, and cosine of power, cosecant of pi over t is cosecant of t. But they have opposite x's, so that makes cosine, secant, tangent, and cotangent opposites. So cosine of pi minus t is the opposite of cosine of t, secant of pi minus t is the opposite of secant of t, tangent of pi minus t is minus tangent of t, and cotangent of pi minus t is minus cotangent of t. And that works whether you're over here in the second quadrant for your angle, and so we see that that works out uh, to be still true because the x's are still opposite, the y's are the same. Or whether you're on the axis or down here in this quadrant, in the third quadrant, on this axis, in the second quadrant, on this axis, in the first quadrant, it doesn't matter where you are, you still have this same, uh, same relationship. What if you have opposite terminal sides? So opposite terminal sides are going to happen when you have both the opposite x and the opposite y. 
no matter where you are here, anywhere around the circle, the opposite terminal side is going to be the opposite x and the opposite y. Now what does that mean in terms of the angle? Well, one angle, one way to get to the opposite side is to add pi to the angle. So if we have any angle t here, then the tangent of pi plus t is the same as the tangent of t, and the cotangent of pi plus t is the same as the cotangent of t. And this is going to be true uh, no matter which quadrant you're in, because here, uh, whether you have y over x or minus y over minus x, it reduces to the same thing. And both of these quadrants, 1 and 3, we have positive tangent and cotangent. And in quadrant 2 and 4, we have um, both negative tangent and cotangent. But the other ones change sine. So notice up here, uh, sine, cosine, secant, and cosecant are all positive in the first quadrant. But in the fourth quadrant, they're all negative. But they have the same absolute value. So the size of the absolute value of y and absolute value of x are the same. R is still just 1 here. And so um, these have the same size but different but opposite signs. That's S-I-G-N sign. And so the net, one's positive and one's negative. So sine of pi plus t is the opposite of whatever sine of t is. Cosecant of pi plus t is also the opposite of cosecant of t. Cosine of pi plus t is the opposite of cosine of t, and secant of pi plus t is the opposite of secant of t. Now, we also have a situation here where we're talking about what are called even and odd functions. And this is where you change the sign um, on... Uh, actually, that's not the one we want to look at. We want to look at the one where you change the sign on x, yeah. What happens? You change the sign on the input. I'm sorry, no. Change the sign. Excuse me. I was right to begin with. We want to change the sign on y. Is actually going to change the sign on the angle t. So notice rotating around positive angle t for the blue point to get point a. If you rotate by negative t, you're changing the sign on the input t. You're actually changing the sign on y, but leaving the sign on x alone. So notice over here, if you rotate around this way, t, and you rotate minus t here, you still get, that's still true that you get this point down here in the third quadrant. Or if you're down here, if you rotate all the way around to here, then rotating the other way around to here, gives you that. And notice again, they have the same reference triangle, or congruent reference triangles, I should say, and they have um, the same x-coordinate and the opposite y. Well, that means the ones that involve x only and r are going to be the same. So that's cosine and secant. So cosine of minus t is the same as cosine of t. Secant of minus t is the same as secant of t. Okay? And the ones that involve y or y and x, that would be sine, cosecant, and cotangent and cotangent. When you do sine of minus t, you get the opposite of sine of t, because these have opposite y's. And cosecant of minus t is the opposite of cosecant of t. And of course, when you're dividing x by y or y by x, you're changing the sine on y but leaving x alone, so the whole fraction changes sine. So tangent of minus t is the opposite of tangent t, and cotangent of minus t is minus cotangent of t. Now, uh, you may recall from your algebra class, for example, in power functions, if you have an even power, like x squared, that if you take f of the opposite of x and plug it in for x, it reduces down to the original function. Okay, and this would be true for any even power here. Well, a, pro a function that has this property, the f of minus x is the same as f of x, in honor of these power functions, is called an even function. And so notice what we're saying here. Another way to say this is that cosine and secant are even functions. When you, change the, when you do f of the opposite of t, you get the same as f of t. In other words, cosine of minus t is the same as cosine of t. And secant of minus t is the same as secant of t. 
On the other hand, if you took an odd degree function, power function, like x to the third, look what happens when you do f of minus x. You get minus x cubed. Three negatives make a negative. It's the opposite of x cubed, or in other words, negative one times x cubed. And so that's the opposite of the original f of x. When they have this property, they're called uh, an odd function. Okay, where f of the opposite of x is the opposite of f of x. Okay, and this works for any odd power function, and it also works for other functions as well, including sine, cosecant, tangent, and cotangent. So all of the basic trig functions are either even or odd. Most functions are neither even nor odd, uh, but but uh, there are special functions that are even and some other special functions that are odd. So even functions like all the even power functions would also include cosine and secant. Odd functions like all the odd power power functions would include sine, cosecant, tangent, and cotangent. Now I want to show you one final set of identities here which in some way are the most obvious but in another way are the most important identities and this is what we call the periodic identities. So sine, cosine, secant, and cosecant uh, have a period of 2 pi. In fact what you will notice is um, let me just, just hide this. If I take any anything here and let's say I'm right here if I rotate around an extra 2 pi I land in exactly the same place. No matter where I start, if I go an extra 2 pi in this direction or that direction or any multiple of 2 pi around extra full circles, as long as I end up the same place that I was on the other one, I'm going to get all of the trig functions to have the same values. So cosine of t plus 2n pi is cosine of t. Sine of t plus 2n pi is sine of t. Secant of 2 of t plus 2 n pi is secant of t, and cosecant of t plus 2 n pi is cosecant of t, where n is any, uh, any integer. So for any integer n, we get these relationships. Now, same thing, I could do tangent in here as well. But we have something else, remember, for tangent, that if, if we rotate just pi, we also get the same tangent. So tangent, we have a smaller period. Tangent and cotangent have period pi. So that if we add or subtract multiples of pi, then we get, in fact, the same, uh, the same value for the tangent. Okay? So... Adding or subtracting multiples of pi to the input will keep the tangent the same, but adding or subtracting multiples of 2 pi, of course, will keep them all the same. Now, if we try to just add pi to, say, the input on cosine, sine, secant, or cosecant, you're going to end up with the opposite sign, not the same thing, because they're opposite sign. All of the, those four are opposite signs uh, when you do this when they're when they're sort of the opposite quadrants there, you get opposite signs. But the opposite quadrants are the same sign for tangent and cotangent. They're both positive here and both negative here. So um, tangent has period pi and cotangent has period pi, but sine and cosine have period 2 pi. Now that is probably the most basic thing about, and maybe the most important thing about these trig functions is that we get whatever's happening here. So let's look at let's look at just the cosine for a minute. As we're going along here, look what happens to cosine. It starts out at it's the x value, so it starts out at one, and it works its way down, smaller and smaller. Remember, it's this length here, this x value, and it's going down further and further and further till it hits zero right there. Now it's negative, so it continues further down keeps going down, keeps going down until it hits right here and then it's negative 1. Now it starts back up, still negative but but closer to 0, bigger than negative 1, working its way up to 0 for there 
and then finally working its way back up to 1, but then what happens? The next time you go around the circle, and again, and again, and again, and again, you're just repeating that cycle over and over and over again. And even if you go around this way, you're repeating that cycle maybe in reverse. But you're, but you're repeating that same cycle. So these are cyclic, or peri what we call periodic functions. So they have a cycle to them. And that's probably the most important thing about these general trig functions. Once we put them on the unit circle, or just a circle in general, and define sine, cosine, tangent, secant, cosecant, and cotangent in general, now they, are, they have a cycle to them. Same way is true for, for sine. Let's look at sine. It starts at zero. It's the y value here, so it starts at zero, and it's increasing. It's getting it's positive, going up, going up, going up, going up, and it starts, stops at one. It gets as high as it gets, and then it comes back down. Still positive, coming down, coming down, coming down. Finally, it gets zero. Still going down. Now it's negative, close to zero, but negative. Now going further and further down, and finally the farthest down it gets is negative one, and then it comes back up, still negative, but working its way back up to zero. And then what does it do again? It cycles through the same set of values over and over and over again every time we go around the circle more and more and more and more and more. Same way for the tangent. Tangent starts at zero, works its way up very, very high, up towards infinity, actually. It's undefined right there. Now it's really, really small, like close to negative infinity. Comes back up to well, somewhere in here it's negative 1, and then it works its way up to 0, and it works its way down to up to positive 1, and then on up towards infinity, undefined there. Now it's, again, at negative infinity, working its way up to negative 1, and then finally working its way up to 0, and then guess what? We do the whole cycle again. Actually, this one cycles between here and here, and then this cycle repeats the first cycle that it had on the other side. So it cycles here once and then it cycles again. Same cycle again, same cycle again. So every time you go through the circle, full circle, tangent and cotangent cycle twice, but cosine, sine, secant, and cosecant cycle once. So those are so because of this, this idea that they go in cycles, that makes these functions very good for approximating things in the real world that go in cycles. And it's, you know, it's very literally a cycle here, because a cycle means a circle, and that's exactly what we're doing. We're going around a circle. Okay, so other things that go in these, uh, that have these periodic type of cycles or cyclic behavior are modeled well by trigonometric functions. So once again, the two most important reasons why we study trig functions are, number one, to do indirect measurement problems like the solving right triangle stuff we did earlier, and number two, to model periodic behavior. In other words, model, model real-world scenarios that have a cyclic pattern to them.